Hey, and welcome to Things Worth Learning. I'm your host, Matt Stauffer, and this is a show where a curious computer programmer, that's me, interviews fascinating people about their passions. Today, my guest is Adam Wathen, the creator of Tailwind CSS. Adam, would you mind telling us a little bit about yourself, whether it's your personal or your professional life? Hey, Matt. Thanks so much for having me on. Yeah, um, like you said, I'm Adam Wathen. I'm the creator of Tailwind CSS, and these days I spend... My time running a small company of people maintaining Tailwind and kind of our related stuff full time. Yeah. And for anybody who doesn't know, because one of the goals, Adam, that you may not know of this podcast is to make this appealing, not just to people in the tech world. Tailwind is a way that people use. So CSS is something people use to style websites. So if you're going to like have a website and you want to make this thing green, this thing blue, you use CSS. But CSS has historically been really difficult for people to I mean, there's certain things I'd love to hear your pitch, actually, that you, mm -hmm. your elevator pitch, but it's been very difficult for people to work together as teams to have very consistent things that are also very easy for other people to maintain later. That's the biggest yeah. pitch that I've always given for it is, is that like, no matter whether it's me or somebody else picking up two years down the road, Tailwind is the thing that makes it super, super, super simple. And of course, it'll make it easy to get started at the beginning, but I should let you get, is there an elevator pitch that you give to people or, or is that, is that a pretty simple version yeah, of it? Yeah, I don't think I have an, an elevator pitch. An elevator pitch, really. I guess I would say that um, I think there's kind of two different parts of working with CSS. One is knowing what all the CSS properties are, what mm -hmm. all the features are, what they actually do when you use them and apply them to different nodes on a website. Yeah. But then the more mysterious side of things, which is I think where everyone always tends to struggle, is how do I structure my CSS? What naming yeah. conventions do I use? What do I do to make things reusable? What should yeah. I base the names on? How many files should I have? Whatever. Yes. And that's actually like the really hard part. Mm -hmm. And I don't think there's a lot of, well, there's a, there's a lot of people who have taken stabs at coming up with an approach for yeah. handling that side and put together recommendations and stuff. And Tailwind ultimately is another set of recommendations for how to handle that side of things. Yeah. And, uh, in a way that I found works well for me and seems to work well for lots of other people too. And happens to be somewhat controversial because it seems to be in a lot of ways doing things the way everyone told you not to do them for a long time, which I think was maybe why, um, in my opinion, that's why people have struggled with this stuff for so long because there's yeah. just been this sort of off limits approach yeah. and everyone's been trying to work in <laughs> the confines of what they thought was, yeah. good. Um, and it turns, it turns out, out that in my opinion anyways, and for what seems to have worked for me, the, uh, the magic bullet has always like been hiding in that off limits area. Mm, so that's good. Yeah. If anybody's really curious about the history of this, uh, Adam is the host of a podcast called full stack radio. And the first ever episode was him kind of draw, describing some of the early ideas of this and me being like, no, that's terrible. I, <laughs> you know, I was History, very embedded yeah. in the old way. Um, you know, the OO CSS and this other stuff like that. And then Adam and I worked together during that time he was developing Tailwind and I like became a convert and like, I was like, give me early access to Tailwind for it's a thing. I changed my, I was like, my website was one of the first websites on the internet using <laughs> it because I was so, so yeah. converted from the old ways of thinking. And we've been using it since it was beta and, it, you know, we're complete. It's like, I just want people who don't know Adam to understand that like what he has done has changed the face of like designing and uh, styling websites like across the entire internet. Like all your favorite companies use Tailwind for stuff. So, yeah. you know, I just want to hype him up because if anybody doesn't know, Tailwind is a really big deal. Adam's a really big deal. He's a very humble guy, which I love and I appreciate, but he's a big deal. Okay. So cool. So let's just move <laughs> on to the question. I don't want to embarrass you anymore. So do you have any sort of life mantra or phrase or idea that you try to live your life by? I don't think I can distill anything like that down into like a single kind of a tweetable phrase or anything, but something I think about a lot, especially lately uh, when I'm making decisions about things I'm doing and what I'm working on is just, is this actually going to get me closer to the life I want? Mm, or is mm -hmm. this just something that I feel like I'm supposed to do Oof. because of external factors or yeah. external expectations, expectations or, yes. or what I see other people doing or how I see other people defining success, you know, mm. and it's become really important to me, um, in the last couple of years to really define my own version of what success in my life looks like and mm. make sure that I'm measuring my decisions against that and not against 
what I kind of see as a more abstract definition of success in terms of the rest of the world. <laughs> I love that because I have joked with the last couple of guests that like this podcast is a little bit therapy for me. And that's certainly where I am right now. Like I'm 37 years old and I'm just now getting to a point of realizing I've been living the majority of my life according to what the people outside of me, whether it's religion or culture or whatever else, it, you know, tells me success looks like or tells me doing the right thing looks like. And so just learning that like, a life lived allowing everybody else to define what success looks like for us would be one that I think we would regret, right? Like rather than like, I found what I wanted, I found what was good for me and my family and I ran for it. So I love that. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, totally. All right. So you know that this podcast is about one topic that you're really passionate about. Could you tell me what we're going to talk about today? Yeah. So what I really like to talk about today specifically is kind of how do I want to describe this? Basically moving from sort of working for yourself to running a company mm -hmm. and how challenging that is and how to, or at least how I'm thinking about trying to make sure that while making that transition, I'm still getting the life that I want mm -hmm. and not finding myself stuck with something that isn't actually making me happy because I think it is way too easy to to land in that position <laughs> yeah. when you're running your own business. Yeah. And that's super familiar. I mean, you and I have talked about this and I've every single time one of my friends has gone off on their own. Um, first thing I say is like, you know, a lot of people think that, uh, you know, I don't want to work for a boss. And so then I'm going to go work for myself thinking that like, let's say you're a programmer, that that means you're going to go be a programmer and, and like mm -hmm. solo work. Yes. But like the moment you start a company, you're now a business owner, like more than you're mm -hmm. a programmer. Right. And yeah. for some people that can be a happy life and some people that can't. So I'm really curious to you, um, like what was the transition like for you? So you, you were an employee and then you yeah. left and then you, mm -hmm. um, you just worked for yourself for a while, right? Like you wrote yeah. books and you did stuff like that. Yeah. And at some point you decided I'm going to turn tailwind into a thing and it's going to become a company. Like what yeah. was the process like for you transitioning from that yeah. to, to, to founding a company basically? Yeah. So when I first kind of went out on my own, I wasn't doing freelancing or, or any of the sorts of things where it's really obvious why your time would be getting sucked up by things that you don't plan to do. Yeah. Like negotiating contracts and trying to find work and, yeah. and all that sort of thing. Um, I was, you know, writing books and creating courses and stuff. And those would happen in these kind of big sprints. And then mm -hmm. I would kind of take a break and work on some interesting things or hack on some stuff or I, a lot of time I'd be doing that while I was working on educational products too. And, um, that was actually pretty great. Like I had a lot of freedom doing that, I think. Mm -hmm. And that's where the first version of tailwind came from. That's where, um, me and Steve eventually had the idea to work on the refactoring UI book and had lots of fun coming up with ideas for how to teach some of that stuff and, uh, you know, working on other open source things, like rebuilding my own personal website, you know, all the yeah. little fun side projects I got to sort of fill my day with. And that was, that was actually really, really nice. And, um, <clears throat> then tailwind came out and it really just took off as a, mm -hmm. as a tool more than I ever sort of expected because I'd never really intended to even release it originally. Yeah. I was just writing it for myself for some other projects and I was doing some live streams where people were watching me build out some SAS ideas and no one cared about any of the stuff I thought they were going to care about. Everyone would just <laughs> ask me, what's the SAS framework is this? What's the SAS framework yeah. is this? So I decided to open source it. And, um, then I guess it was about a year and a half after releasing it. I decided I wanted to work on it full time. Mm -hmm. Um, I was supposed to be starting a business actually with someone else working on a SaaS app idea. And then when me and Steve released the refactoring UI book and Tailwind was getting really popular, I decided to back out of that because it just felt like, uh, this Tailwind thing is there's so much potential here to really mm -hmm. like make my dent in the universe. It felt like, you yeah. know, this was like my Laravel, you know, if you're yeah. thinking of someone like Taylor, um, what I could be remembered for. And that felt like it would be a wasted opportunity to not do that. Yeah. So I worked on that just kind of full time, like getting to 1.0, working on, um, you know, I, some videos and documentation and adding new features and stuff like that. And the whole while that was 
all being basically funded by the info products and stuff that I'd worked on, like refactoring UI, the book I did with Steve continues to be really successful to this day without us really doing anything. Yeah. Um, so that gave me a lot of freedom to just kind of work on that stuff and not think about making money, which was like the dream. That's exactly yeah. what I wanted just to be able to work on the things I find interesting and not really worry about the financial side of things. And, uh, me and Steve wanted to make some tailwind UI or like tailwind components, tailwind mm -hmm. templates. We had this idea just to, if honest, if honestly only to make the community grow and, mm -hmm kind of add more awesome stuff. We wanted to design a bunch of stuff, build it and, and release it. And yeah. it made sense to do that commercially, I think, because of course the info product stuff isn't going to sell for the rest of time. Yeah. And me and Steve were already in business together. And that was the perfect kind of overlap of our two skill sets. So we started working on that and I, I never really had huge expectations for it. I didn't think it was going to do as well as refactoring UI, for example. Mm -hmm. But it did way better than refactoring UI, actually. Yeah. And we found ourselves in this position where it was like, holy crap, we have a lot of expectations on us right now. We have mm -hmm. all these support emails coming in. We have issues being opened up in Tailwind. We have people wanting new features because there's so many people using it now. We have to finish all these Tailwind UI components because we released it in early access and we want to add more. Yeah. And we have all these people asking us for for new designs and stuff. And we just found ourselves like extremely stressed to the point mm -hmm. where we had gone from, you know, six months prior sort of feeling like we had this open life. rain to do yeah. whatever we want and live life and work on fun things to releasing this product that, I mean, in a lot of ways, I'm sure it's just psychological that you could just ignore the pressures and expectations of people and just be like, Oh no, this, well, we did that and we're done that. Yeah. And now we're just going to go back to doing whatever. But for whatever reason, it just didn't feel that way. It felt like, man, we are, there's a lot of people counting on us now. Mm -hmm. And, um, in a lot of ways, it felt like we were sort of forced to turn it into a real company, not because mm. we actually decided the next challenge I want to take on in life is becoming yeah. a CEO of a company and learning how to lead a team <laughs> and deal with people problems and whatever. Cause that like is not interesting to me at all. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But we kind of had to do it, it felt like, because it just yeah. felt like we needed help. It felt like we can't keep up with this stuff. We need to figure out how to use some of the resources that we have financially from these mm -hmm. products to get other people to help us so that yeah. we aren't drowning. In, yeah. So you uh, actually like the life that you're living, whatever. basically. Yeah. Yeah. So that's kind of how we got to um, this spot. Mm -hmm. Okay. So at that point you went from the two of us are in business partnership together and we're both kind of just doing the thing, right? So even though it was two of you, it was technically a company, it was still just like a designer and a programmer who liked working together, doing some fun stuff mm -hmm. together. You didn't have employees, you didn't have like business structures. And I, th I know things are different in Canada than they are in the US, but yeah. I assume that your incorporation was at least a little bit different. But regardless, your day-to-day -day life was not someone who runs a business. It was still individual yeah. contributor, and right? It, it wasn't even like, we weren't even working together really every day, right? Like we okay. started the company because there needs to be some entity that receives the money from the book sales. Right. We talk every day cause we're great friends and we like yeah. hacking on things together, but it wasn't like we were spending every day working on projects together. Steve was working on icons for fun or whatever. And I was yeah. working on tailwind features and we chat because we're friends and it's nice to have social interactions throughout the day, yeah. but we weren't necessarily like pushing something forward together every day mm -hmm. all the time, you know? Um, it wasn't until we wanted to start working on the templates that mm -hmm. we kind of got focused again on, on working really in close collaboration. So when you did that, at some point you all had to make the decision, Hey, we got to turn this into a thing. We're going to hire. Did you actually sit down and decide who's going to take what role and you're going to do the more kind of CEO leadershipy stuff or like, what was that process like of no, making those decisions? Not really. Yeah. <laughs> it was just kind of just, <laughs> there's a fire, uh, where's yep. some water, you know, um, <laughs> let's, we need help. We don't know what to do with help. Uh, but I think yeah. that's what we need. And okay. can we find someone? And we hired Brad, who's the first person that we hired here. And I don't know anything about hiring people. I still yeah. basically don't know anything about hiring people. The way we hired Brad was I sat down and I was trying to think who could we hire? And I thought, 
What about Brad? He does that like VS Code extension for Tailwind. He's probably pretty mm-hmm. smart, and he seems like he knows a lot about this stuff. I'm just going to email him and see if he wants to work here. <laughs> and he's like, "Yes, yeah, sure, I want to work here." So then he started working here. Easy, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, hiring's a little and, bit easier uh, when you're such a desirable place to work, right? Everyone, everyone wants to work at Tailwind. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, we got really lucky there because I've learned since that it is important to be pretty uh, diligent about mm-hmm. hiring. Yeah. Um, but. Uh, yeah, so we didn't take any of that stuff super seriously in terms of trying to do things right or figure out who would do what role. It just kind of felt that there was so much stuff to do that we needed to needed help. And I found out pretty quickly that having help is helpful, but it creates more work yes. still, you know? Yep. Um, and that has been probably the biggest challenge is figuring out how do you get help without it turning into more responsibility and more work Mm -hmm. because that's naturally what happens when you involve more people. If you're not very, very deliberate about creating systems and stuff for, Mm -hmm. um, making people able to provide that help without you becoming a bottleneck for it still, Mm. you know? Um, and that has, that's sort of what it it feels like I've been dealing with for the last year and a half and trying to, slowly get better at and find find solutions to <laughs> it's funny because uh, you know titan's been around for 10 years now and i still think that's what i'm figuring out it's like because i think mm-hmm. i'm a bottleneck for too many things because i want my hands in every pie i want my influence in the culture yeah. and like we yeah. just realized this year we have an apprenticeship that was like my baby and i'm not at a point where i can give the effort towards it that i should and they were just kind of gently they're like matt we need other people to be running this because we need someone who yeah. has more time and energy than you i was like so like, what does it look like for you to establish, like to begin establishing and identifying where are those structures and where are the places where you're the bottleneck and everything? Like, what does the process look like for you of bringing on your first employee? And cause I can imagine you can bring on your first employee and just get completely sucked up in support. So you had to like make some, yeah. like some evaluations and systems. What did that process look like for you? Yeah, honestly still figuring it out, but I can, I can try and share some of the things that at some point we weren't doing that we are doing now that that I feel like I made things better. So I think the biggest one was adopting the shape up methodology for kind of project planning. Um, so for anyone who's not familiar with that at at its core, it's really just about kind of batching your, your planning and Mm -hmm. uh, putting together batches of work that are six weeks long where you say, this is all the stuff you want to get done in the next six weeks. And, um, then you take a two week break between each one to kind of figure out what you want to do next and maybe react to any issues that came up based on the work that you did in the previous six weeks. And, um, that's eight weeks when you combine, you know, the six weeks of work and the two weeks of sort of reaction time. And you get six shots of that each year. Basically. I was just cal- counting. I'm like, how many eight week segments do you get? <laughs> yeah. Right. It's, it feels like you should have more, but you only get six of those per year, Yeah, which is really focusing because it helps you figure out like, okay, everyone has a laundry list of things they want to do in their business Mm -hmm. and things they want to release and whatever. If you know, you can only do six of them a year though. It really helps you prioritize Mm -hmm. and helps Mm -hmm. you realize that, um, you have to start working on those things sooner than you think Mm -hmm. most of the Mm -hmm. time and and kind of putting them in on the roadmap earlier than you think for them to actually get done when you actually want them to get done. Yeah. The reason this really made a difference for us is because before this, we were just kind of flying by the seat of our pants and mm-hmm. I would work with Brad, for example, to come up with, um, a project for him to tackle. And it would maybe be like a four or five day thing. And then at the end of the that, I'd have to come up with another thing and then yeah. that'd be two or three days. And maybe some of them were like two weeks and yeah. it was just constantly, okay, what do we do next? What do we do next? What do we do next? And because of that, I felt like a lot of really important things were just getting kicked down the Mm -hmm. road Mm -hmm. because the only things that we were working on were things that I could confidently hand off with five minutes of preparation because we were just in the middle of doing something else that we needed from you. Yeah, Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. So that was super stressful because I always Mm -hmm. felt like I was, I always felt like there was this like ticking time bomb of, oh crap, someone's going to need direction from me soon. Someone's going to need direction from me soon. Mm -hmm. Um, So by doing the, the shape up stuff. Instead, I just kind of write up this big message for the team at the beginning of the six weeks. That's like, here's all the projects we're going to do this week. Here's all the information that I think we need to do them. And I 
only give as much information as necessary because I want people on the team to have as much Agency. influence on the yeah. actual solutions and stuff as possible. But I try to at least cover like, here's the things I think you are, you're probably going to ask me so that you just have that information right away and you don't feel mm -hmm. blocked. And, um, the nice thing about that is generally I'm basically free for six weeks after yeah. doing that. Yeah, and that's not really true because there yeah. are always things come up that decisions need to be made, and and uh, sometimes you need to kind of make sure that uh, we're prioritizing things properly and and stuff like that because uh, there's only it feels like the job of my job is to sort of have this big picture view of everything that's happening and whether things are mm -hmm. happening at the right time or whether too much time is being spent on this, that that person wouldn't really have any idea if, if they're spending too much time on it or not, because they don't have the full context of yeah. what else needs to get done necessarily or whatever. Um, but that, that made a big difference mm. um, for us because it, it let me kind of reclaim some of my, my time back because like I kind of alluded to the last thing I wanted when starting a business was to become like a, a leader, you know? Yeah. And, and the funny thing is like, you know, I mentioned at the very beginning of our conversation, how something I've been thinking about a lot lately is making sure that I'm making decisions for myself and not for some mm -hmm. abstract idea of what I feel like I'm supposed to be doing. I do feel like when we first started hiring people, I, I put on this hat of, okay, I'm going to like be a real business owner now mm -hmm. and I'm going to do what startups do. And I'm going to, yeah. you know, and, and, um, I was excited about that. I thought, oh, I'm going to like be the best boss ever. And I'm going to create this amazing company. And yeah. I'm going to be like the type of guy that one day is going to write a book about how to run a company like that, right. that, like not to that extreme, but you know what I mean? Like yeah, really yeah, just like embracing energy. that or whatever. And eventually I just kind of had this like, moment where I realized it was like a total LARP, you know, yeah. I felt like playing LinkedIn <laughs> dress up where uh -huh. <laughs> I, I was just like cringing at myself for yeah. even believing in my head that I was this business guy or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it, it was just like so embarrassing to myself huh. and when I knew really what I want to do is wake up every day and do whatever I want yes. creatively on whatever I find interesting. Yeah. And that all I really care about in terms of building a company is making my own life better. And, and that sounds like selfish or something, mm -hmm. I think, which is a hard thing to, to wrestle with because I think, and I was super guilty of this too, before I started my own company, there's, there's a lot of just, um, attitudes that exist out in the world from people who have never worked for themselves or tried to mm -hmm. build a business where, all sort of business owners are these like fat cats who mm -hmm. kind of are just like sort of taking advantage of people and paying people as little as possible so they can be Buy their rich own and not have yeah. to do any work. And, yeah. and, um, and there's this very like stick it to the man sort of mentality, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and that's like not even remotely <laughs> accurate. I don't think, I think maybe there's, a, that's accurate for s maybe super giant corporations, yeah. but but even then I have like so much empathy for the CEO of time Warner now yeah. you know, that I, I wouldn't have had yep. um, <clears throat> back in the day, because like the reality is the second you start, stop receiving a paycheck from your boss and, and start receiving income from selling products, you're running a business now and, and did, did some switch flip that automatically made you this right. like, evil person trying to take advantage of people wherever. No, you're just no. trying to, just like you're trying to have a great lifestyle when you're working for another company, you're just trying yeah. to improve your, your own lifestyle. You know, you want to be happy. You want to, you want to look back on the time you spent on this planet and feel like it was well spent and that you enjoyed yeah. it. So for me, starting a company wasn't about like my mission is to create this incredible place to work where everyone is super happy. And my job is to like, give this gift of creating these amazing careers for people. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's not to say that like, we, we don't do that because yeah. of course we do that. But it, it at the end of the day, br the brutally honest truth is that that comes from a place of 
I want people to be happy here because I need their help. Yeah. And if I don't have help from people, then I'm going to be miserable because yeah. I'm going to be stressed <laughs> and I'm going to be overworked. Right. And I, I don't think, I think that's probably true of more people than, than we think. And I, I don't know that that's, people are honest and enough about that. Like I love the people who work here and I want them to have great jobs. And, you know, we've given everyone who works here multiple raises and no one's ever asked for a raise. Yeah. We give people profit sharing and no one ever asked for that. We give yeah. people, you know, two weeks off for Christmas and no one ever asks for it. And right. I just want this to be the best place for people. I just want this to be a company that no one ever quits because yeah. I, I, don't want to train people again. I don't want to find people again. <laughs> right. You know, you know, what, you know yeah. what I mean? So at the end of the day, the, out, the outcome is the, is the same, mm -hmm. but I hate feeling the pressure of, of what I think sort of the tech industry puts out there in terms of what a CEO is supposed to be mm -hmm. or, or what a boss is supposed to be. And, uh, I, I don't think people realize that like the people in charge running these companies are, people themselves mm -hmm. with incredible amounts of pressure and struggles to deal with. And, yeah. um, and it's lonely because it feels like you can't even be honest or open about any of that stuff. Like a big shift that I noticed that I still am figuring out how to deal with is when I was just working just by myself or just with Steve, mm -hmm. any problem I had, I could just go to Twitter with. Yeah. Every, any single struggle I was having, anything I was trying to figure out, I could go to Twitter with it. I feel like I can't talk about mm. any of the things that I'm trying to figure out publicly mm. anymore because there are things like, um, what's the best way to like give critical feedback to someone on the team when they do something in a way that's different than you think. And as yeah. soon as I tweet that now, everyone on the team is going to think, am I the one that yeah. I'm supposed is waiting that he hasn't given critical feedback to. Yeah. It's just you you can't be open about mm -hmm. things. Even even though it's not like there's anything malicious or negative or whatever, but your yeah. your problems you need to talk to other people who are in the same position as you and have more experience with you or than you and yeah, you just you don't it's it's hard to even find that. I've been really lucky to even find even a handful of people that I feel like I can talk to about running a company, you know, yeah. and the sort of the challenges that come along with that. But I never anticipated how much different mm -hmm. it would be in terms of, um, just feeling like you can't get input on your, on your problems at the scale that I was able to do before, Yeah, you know? Um, so mm. I don't know. I feel like I'm rambling at this point. I don't even know like how we got here or where we came from, but no, I feel like fantastic. a good well, time I to, to take a break. Sure. Take <laughs> a breather. You, I, yeah. I think that one of the really great things that you said there is that, um, like bosses are people and owners and CEOs are people. And again, like, like you acknowledge, there are certainly circumstances and, and often more common in the bigger companies where the CEO is making, you know, jillions of dollars and the people are mistreated. That certainly exists. But when we're talking on these smaller scale things, like what we're talking about, um, it's, it, I like one of the questions to ask to someone is, is it valid? for an owner of a company to want to optimize their best life like it is for employees. And I think a lot of the pushback against owners being able to do that is from a world in which it is considered okay for owners to do so. And it's not considered okay for employees to do so. Right. The employees mm -hmm. just have to sit and do the work and the owners are working on their stock options, but the, yeah. the going the whole way, the opposite direction isn't helpful either. Like you must endure blah, blah, blah. And you must have these value, whatever. So like I, I look a lot at like the financial independence for, and retire early communities. And one of the thing that I like the most about financial independence is they describe that like you get your job and side hustle or whatever else situation to the point where you're more able to live the life that you want to live it doesn't mean not working, but it means like doing the type of work that you like doing. So a lot of people hear financial independence retire early and they're like, oh, that means you're just never going to work a day in your life. And the answer for most people is no, I just don't want to, like I was literally listening to a podcast last night where she's like, I, I had a two hour commute from Brooklyn, New Jersey and a two hour commute back. And I had three kids and like, I hate that life. So for her financial independence was getting their finances to the point where she could work near her home. That was literally it. She didn't want to stop working. Yeah. And so for you, I feel like the, that level, you know, you're not calling it financial independence, but you want your day every day to look like something that you enjoy. And you're working mm -hmm. on creating a company in which every day you yeah. get to wake up and do something that actually makes you happy. And like, is that yeah. something that's not valid for you? No, it's totally valid. Yeah. So. Yeah. It, it, yeah, that's exactly right. And it's, it's hard to achieve. I think there, mm -hmm. 
what I'm realizing is it takes very, very deliberate effort or mm-hmm. you fall into this trap of just not having that. Like something that kind of dawned on me in the last couple of months is like financially, I have no reason to work at this mm-hmm. point. You know, I, we've had a lot of success. I've been able to put enough money away that I can take care of my family happily for the rest of my life. Yeah. But I still don't feel free, you know, mm. because I'm not free of the responsibility that I have mm-hmm. to, to, yeah. I mean, I could just delete my GitHub account and right. make all of stuff off private and just yeah. whatever, but I wouldn't be happy with that either. I would feel like I just tarnished the thing I've worked so hard mm-hmm. on to, again, like kind of make this dent in the universe and have this thing that, um, helped all these people that you can say, I did that, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so if it's, it's like, what are you, what are you supposed to do? If, if that's important to you, you have to keep it running somehow. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't matter how much money is in your bank account. If you feel like you can't just shut all that down without that making you unhappy, yeah. then you're stuck anyways, you yeah. know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and, uh, that has been brutal to deal with. And I, I'm only just starting to try and figure out how, how to, how to actually deal with that. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't really even have an answer other than I can say some things that I've tried, you know, some things I'm hoping to try next. Yeah. I love that. Historically, I've always, I've always considered myself part of the team in terms Mm -hmm. of, uh, when we have projects and I say, person A is going to handle this person B is going to handle this and I'm going to handle this, you know? And, um, I, I think what I'm realizing is I need to make it so I don't actually have to do anything at the company. And that's the trick. This is what everyone says. Like, this is like the whole e-myth thing. And, (laughs) And, uh, you know, this advice comes from, from millions of places, but Mm -hmm. I've always kind of like ignored it a little bit, I guess. Cause I always thought like, well, that's advice for people who are in the build businesses and create passive income and, Mm -hmm. you know, sell across, you know, whatever sort of lifestyle. And that's not what I wanted to do. Like I want to work, I want to build things. I I Mm want to make stuff. So I never felt like that was applicable to me. I I always felt like creating systems at your company to sort of automate this robot that makes you money. That that's not my goal. Like my goal, Mm -hmm. I'm not interested in building a business. I'm interested in, being creative and building tools and doing whatever else. Yeah. Um, the quote that, uh, you know what, this would have been like the mantra, honestly, that I should have shared at the beginning. This is like yeah. my favorite quote of all time, which is, um, from Walt Disney actually, huh. which is that we don't make movies to make money. We make money to make movies. Um, that's cool. And I like that, that. is hundred wow. percent how I feel with the stuff that we work on. Like mm-hmm. the only reason the tailwind UI templates cost money is so that I can afford to keep making more yeah. talent stuff and yeah. whatever, you know, I think a lot of business are the businesses are the reverse. It's people mm-hmm. looking for opportunities to create something that can make money. And that's totally fine. Yeah. Everyone yeah. who wants to do that is in the right. They're trying mm-hmm. to create a lifestyle for themselves. They're trying to figure out how to spend their days doing what they love and not mm-hmm. kind of doing a job they don't like or whatever. Yeah. Um, but for me, it's, it's like, I, I guess at the, in, in some ways it's like the same thing, you know, because I, I just want to spend my time doing the, the things I love. It just how mm-hmm. it happens to be the things that I love or the things that benefit the company that we're yeah. able to, to sell and stuff as well. Um, but yeah, whatever, what I'm realizing now, I think is that the only way for me to really feel free is to feel like I can step away from the business for six weeks and come just back and ask that yeah. have the business be better. And I don't yep. feel like that yet, but, um, I work with like a coach who helps me with a lot of this stuff. And she mm-hmm. has been harping on me for like a year to say, I think you need to take a break. I think you need yes. to take a break. And something I've always told her, which I still believe is true. And I tweeted something about this the other day and reply to someone else is that, A lot of the breaks people talk about when they say this stuff is like, you need to, you know, take two weeks off and like relax and go on vacation or whatever. Mm -hmm. But when you 
when you own your own company and when you have a family with two young kids, I feel like vacation is like way more stressful than work. Yes, it um, is. <laughs> there's no like, there's no relaxing vacation. You yeah. know, there's no, I, I remember the last trip me and my wife took before we had kids, we went to Clearwater beach for a week and we just kind of sat by the pool yeah. Each with a book in our hand for like yeah. three hours at a time in the sun until we felt hungry. It's like, are you hungry? Yeah, I'm hungry. Yeah, let's go food. walk down the beach until we find somewhere to eat. Just like the yeah. most relaxing, like my favorite trip we've ever been on, right? Yeah. I've never once felt like that relaxed <laughs> since uh no, definitely not. <laughs> since the kids were born, you know? <laughs> and I think it's gonna be oh, many God. years until <laughs> until yeah. we get to have that again. But anyways, what I've been talking about with the my coach is you know, she's like, you need to figure out how to be able to take two months off where you don't talk to anyone at the company effectively. Mm -hmm. And, and there's two ways to do it. I think one is to just do it and just mm -hmm. see what happens and maybe yeah. find out that all my fears are totally invalid and that mm -hmm. things will continue to operate and everything will go smoothly and things will be great. And that would be awesome. Um, and the other option is, okay, well maybe if you just put that on the calendar and mm -hmm. say, Okay, from like mid February till the end of March, I am just like going to be off the grid in terms yeah. of what we're doing here. How does that influence what I should be spending my time on right now? Right. Um, and something I've been wanting to do for like six months is put together a really comprehensive like company handbook that mm -hmm. covers basically every opinion I have about every <laughs> single thing that we do here. So it's all written down. Yeah. Um, and, and what was helpful to me, and this actually really made me feel like all this was more possible is the other week I made a list of, um, what, what would I define success as in terms of me being gone for a week? These are all mm -hmm. the things that I would need to happen for me to feel like it went well. Yeah. And those are things like, I'll pull up the list right now and I'll, I'll share some specific examples. Yeah, I love this. So one is like, um, there are less GitHub issues open uh -huh. than there were when I left, yeah. you know, or even something as simple as everyone was paid on time, yeah. you know, <laughs> or, um, yeah. a well-written marketing email is sent out for a Tailwind UI update that matches or improves on the style of marketing emails I normally write Yeah, or, um, Let's see. A new headless UI component is added with an, an API that I didn't design with great documentation mm -hmm. that fits well with the existing documentation. Mm -hmm. And before I wrote this list, these were all just like abstract fears kind of yeah. trapped in my head. Of that like, that well, happen, this isn't going right? to go well. This isn't going yeah. well. This needs me. This needs me. But as soon as I wrote all this down and I started going through the list, I felt like all I have to do is write a document for each one of these bullet points that mm -hmm. includes everything I think is important to make sure that this is possible to happen yeah. without me here. Yeah. And, um, that was a real shift in my mindset of what was possible in terms of being able to yeah. break away from, uh, the, the company, because I don't want to not be involved. You know, I mm -hmm. want to work on this stuff every single day, but what I'm realizing is the big source of my stress is I feel like I am required, you know, mm -hmm. and that is, is not a good feeling. You want to feel mm -hmm. like, well, if I don't feel like doing that, yeah. that the company isn't going to die as yeah. a result. And, um, I also want to believe that the more time that I have to not be working on sort of just the day to day writing emails, Operations, writing documentations, yeah. closing GitHub issues, blah, 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 blah. The more I, I think I can actually offer more to the company, Yes, you know, only um, do what only you can do. Right. That. And just like, I need time to be bored, you yeah, know, yeah. I need like, I need time to work on things that, um, might go nowhere, you yeah. know? Yeah. Uh, I need time to get excited about something. I don't remember the last time I was like really excited mm. about anything that I did. It's all just been the to-do list, yes. you know, of yeah. stuff to get through. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah. So I don't know. My goal anyways is over the Christmas break. I want to work on this company handbook. I want to write these documents for all the things on this list that I think will try and ensure that 
everything can work. And then I want to take like six weeks off towards the beginning of the year. And I want to spend like the first three weeks, like writing two or three songs and recording them. Yes. Something that's creative and fun, but has nothing, nothing to, to do, do with work. programming, you know? Yeah. And, <laughs> and just see, uh, see what happens. Mm -hmm. Um, so I don't know that that's what I've been thinking about a lot lately. And some of the ideas that have me excited for how to hopefully, I love that kind of get a better work life balance and, mm -hmm. uh, and stuff. But, um, yeah, yet to see if it'll actually work. Yeah. But, uh, well, one of, yeah. one of the things I loved that, um, when you and I were talking about planning this episode is you have this desire, like there's a lot of things that you're an expert on and you're like, I don't, I don't feel like those are the things I'm passionate about because I already know them super well. I want to talk about something that I'm still in the middle of. And I really yeah. appreciate your desire to do that because you share as you learn Like that's one of the things that got you most popular in the first place is you're like, Hey, I learned this thing. Now I'm going to teach you as I'm learning versus like, like you could have sat here and talked to me about all sorts of different, like technical and architecture things that, you know, backwards and forwards and blown everyone's mind. And instead you're willing to be vulnerable and say like, I don't know what the hell I'm doing here. So first of all, thank you for that. <laughs> but second, of all, I think it makes it a lot more interesting because when we tell the stories afterwards, we often forget like this moment of like, I'm not yeah, sure. And whatever, definitely. cause like, we're not looking at it after your six weeks telling us about how great it was. Um, I'm really excited for you. I mean, it, it, I didn't realize how similar states that we're in, but my executive coach has been like. I, there's this book, good to great and talks about how these, um, the most successful companies do well when the charismatic front leader is able to step away and everything still continues at the same quality level. And so then it asked me, leads me asking these questions of what are the things I'm anxious about not going well? So I took a day off and then I took a week off and I'm trying to get to the point where I could take a month off. And again, just like you, like I would like to, you know, spend a little bit of time on a beach or something like that. But just like you said, like I miss when I was doing a recording live stream, you know, live stream videos about some new technology I've never worked with. Like I picked up NFTs and crypto purely because yeah. <laughs> it was exciting to me. And because I was like, this is something nobody knows. There's no documentation. I'm just going to have to teach myself. Oh, cool. Let's do it. Yeah. So I totally feel you on that. Something I would actually like to get your input on mm -hmm. is, um, I think one of the biggest things that I've, I've struggled with and even getting to this point and why I've maybe resisted trying to do some of these, th these things this way is I've always hated the idea of being very prescriptive with mm -hmm. how people work and how they work on projects and stuff and putting together a handbook or creating systems or writing down like mm -hmm. guidelines for things always just felt like I'm going to make people miserable yes. because who wants to be micromanaged that way, you know? Yeah. And I don't think that really, I think micromanagement is a different thing, but that's like the fear that's in my head is mm -hmm. the second I, I give up on trying to just hope that everyone feels all the confidence in the world to do things with no direction. Yeah. I've succumbed to like becoming this horrible company where, mm -hmm. um, everyone has to do things in a specific way and do, no one gets to be creative and, and whatever. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think that's totally unreasonable. And I think it's just like an exaggerated polarized version of two possibilities, you know? Yeah. But what, what I think actually changed my mind on that. And the, I'm curious to see if you remember this because this is, um, uh, it's related to my time at Titan, but yeah, I started thinking like, okay, well, I, what would I want if I was an employee? I, I would want to feel like I could do, have total control over things and make decisions on things and do things, you know, my way and up to my standards and, and blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. Um, but then when I actually think about real experiences I've had at real companies, I think like the most frustrated I've ever been at companies is when I, when I feel like other people aren't telling me the way they think they want things done. Yes. You know, mm -hmm. yep. <laughs> and That's... I remember at Titan, just like I, and, and the funny thing is, like I think I'm worse for this than the average person, and yet yeah. now I run a company where I want to give everyone full autonomy over everything. Mm -hmm. But I remember uh, when I worked at Titan and, and when I worked at other places, I felt like I was always asking, like, would you put this in this file or would you put this in this file? I want to do things <laughs> the way Matt would do them because I want to make sure Matt's happy with it, and uh -huh. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> um, oh, that's so funny. So um, when I think about that, it, it makes me think like, well, maybe putting together a handbook or creating systems is, is going to do the opposite of what I feared, mm -hmm. you know? And I guess that's what I hope. I think it, it gives people confidence to do their work yeah. really well instead of being 
constantly second guessing if they're doing things the ex- way that's expected or or not expected. Yeah. And I'm sure there's a balance, um, but I don't know if that's something you think about much or if, yeah. or if my memory of that <laughs> lines up with your memory. No, of it, it does. And I, I love that you asked it because we're in the middle right now of writing more processes. And I'm, I'm very anti-process because I don't want to be like, well, we had this one, like Dave Hicking, who works at Titan often calls it organizational scar tissue. We had this one thing happen wrong and now we're going to make a process to ensure that it never happens wrong again. And you end up basically like with a, with a restaurant with signs everywhere, must wear shoes, mm-hmm. must not throw bubble because they just, all the things that, that happen. And they're like, we don't want that kind of company, but like, it's funny because when you would ask those questions, there's a combination of me being like, yeah, like I want everything to look the way I want. Also, like I learned an incredible amount from you as a programmer when you were working for me. And I was like, if you only did the things I did, we would be worse off. And I think you also knew that while we were there. One of the things I've found is that you can set the baseline and then give people agency and trust to diverge from the baseline when they believe that it's for a good reason. So rather than them always having to ask like, what would Matt want? Like we, you like literally one of the things when you did there was built a a continuous integration service that we were joking was just kind of like Matt's code reviews as a, as a continuous integration service, right? (laughs) It's like, let's, let's all know what the baseline of like what the things are that Matt or Adam wants so that when someone needs to ask that question, it's just very clear. It's like, yes, this is what he wants. These are the baselines, these are the expectations. And if you just wanted to follow the rules, you can just follow the rules. But you're a grown human being. You're able to A, like ask for these things to be changed. So people know, like, if there's a code style thing or whatever that I implement, and it's code style simpler, but the start there and they disagree with mm-hmm. it, they'll just say it and they'll say, actually, you know what? Because yeah. of this or, oh, things are changed. I'm like, cool. Sounds good to me, right? Like, it's not as if I'm defining this as the be all end all. It's like, this is our starting place. But further, yeah. like in a particular circumstance, if it depends, which, you know, which is like true for all the programming ends up being the answer in this one, you say it depends and this one depends a different way, then they just do it. And they, they don't worry that I'm going to hound and say, didn't you see the handbook says that you're supposed to do blah, blah, blah. So I yeah. think if you're giving people like, you know, like the best creativity for musicians doesn't come from just playing shit. It comes from knowing how to do all the perfect chords and the perfect riffs and doing it right. And then knowing when to break the rules. I feel like it's the same way there, like setting Mm -hmm. up the basic foundations and then trusting them to know when to go from it. I think is, I, I mean, and like hearing it that way, does it make sense to you as someone who's been in that situation? Yeah. I like that. I think it, it makes, in my mind, I'm thinking like, okay, here's all the answers to every question you might have. So you have it and you don't feel like, stuck or that you have to ask. Uh But, um, if you have a better idea, like just do do that, this (laughs) this isn't here to control you. This is here to, to remove friction on the path Mm -hmm. of getting the thing done. You Mm -hmm. know, that's the only goal of everything that's written down here is to like, give you all the information you need to make the best decision, not to, Mm -hmm. um, prevent you from doing things in a different way when you know there's a better way yeah. to do things. So I think that's going to be a power, an important and powerful thing to communicate um, as part of this whole project. I love that. And I know we're, we're short on time, but one last thing I want to add, it's, uh, I know it's harder for Tailwind to do this, but it tightened the thing that is making it easiest for me to step away is levels of leadership, which was also something I rejected for ages. I was like, we're going to be flat. Mm-hmm. It's going to be me and Dan and the employees. Right. And what I discovered was, um, like I have, we have apprentices, we have staff or mid programmers, we have lead programmers, we have a principal programmer. So just from a programming perspective, not even looking at the project management side or ops side, um, we have all these levels and previous, I would just say, I just want my fingers in every single pie. I want to be managing everybody. But now I've gotten to the point where like, for example, I used to be on every single project call for every single client and read every single GitHub pull request that came in from every project, the entire company. We have, I don't know, 30 people or something like that. I can't do that. And I only stopped doing that very recently because I was like, wait a minute, we have lead programmers in place who I trust, who I know will bring a question up to me if they need. So now there's that layer of disconnect where like the, uh, the lead programmers know what I want or know how to do things well, much better than the staff do much better than the apprentices do. So I trust them to be like a little mini umbrella over a little mini umbrella over the particular piece of the project that they're on. And so mm-hmm. I don't worry about having my, so I stepped away. I like unsubscribed from a whole bunch of channels. I unsubscribed a whole bunch of GitHub things, but then I was like, yeah, but that's only a project base. But then Keith, um, who used to be a senior programmer is now a principal programmer. And his job is to kind of be the umbrella over all of them. So he now handles a lot of their one-on-ones and he's the one they can go to if they get stuck. So yeah. again, now I can step away. And even if what we have defined is not there, they now have a person to go to, to ask those questions. Who's not mm-hmm. me. So now I can step back a little bit further. Totally. So it's, 
it's yep. not always just about a process. It's also about trusting people. And you mm -hmm. may end up finding yourself in a place where you take one of your programmers and say, you know, like, and I don't know, because again, you guys are small, so that might not make sense, but something yeah. that allows you to not just put a system in place, but also sometimes put a person in a place to be able to help you with that. Yeah, totally. I've, I'm already finding that because um, I think what I wanted for the longest time was how do I get everyone at the company to know exactly what to do all the time without being told yes. anything? Yeah. You know, how yeah. do I just get people to know that this problem is more important than this problem or this problem is more important than this problem? I just want everyone to know that because yeah. I feel like I'm the only one who knows all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And, um, it was, it was demoralizing basically feeling like I couldn't come up with a solution to that. Mm -hmm. Um, because I think at the end of the day, it's just, it's not totally realistic, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. But what I realized eventually was that, well, it's not so much that I want everyone to always know exactly what to do without anyone offering them any context or any direction or anything. It's that I don't want to be on the hook for all of that yes. myself, you know? Mm -hmm. So that doesn't mean that everyone has to know everything all the time. Yeah. It just means that some things I need to know that I don't have to know about, yes. you know? Yeah. And there are a lot of things that we've, I've successfully like removed myself from like customer support. Mm -hmm. I, I haven't logged in to help scout for months love at it. all, yeah, you know, love which that. is wonderful. Um, and I'm trying to work towards more of those things being totally off my plate. Um, but that was like a breakthrough for mm -hmm. sure. Realizing that hierarchy exists, uh, for a reason, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. um, in terms of just, uh, yeah, it's easier for me to have three people that I talk to and those three people to have three people that they talk to than, yeah. than to try and make everything one magically know what's going on and what yes. should be happening at all times. Um, and you can also yeah. give those people like some time and some space to take responsibility for that work and do less individual contributing. So you're, you're mm -hmm. starting them a little bit on the process of step away from individual contributing a little bit, be a little bit more responsible for helping other people, but not to the degree that I am. Right. And so mm -hmm. they can get a little bit of that taste without you pull, fully putting them like in a CEO role. Um, and so they, you're not just putting stuff on their plate without kind of, you know, like giving their space for it. So but that means you have to be intentional about it and you have to be, you know, like we're doing this with, there's a name. We're telling everybody, this is the person you go to. If you have a question about X, Y, Z, we're giving them some freedom and space and, you know, what, and extra pay or whatever to be able to do that thing. But then now they've accepted that as a part of their responsibility. And then now they come to you when they're stuck, which is much less frequent because you picked people that you trust to be in that space. And like, if you totally. get to the point where Keith has to ask me about something, I know it's a big freaking deal. Right. And it's very infrequent. Yeah. And I'm always immediately accessible because, you know, like I yeah. know that Keith, uh, Keith filters out 99.9% .9 of the stuff. Right. So, and the other thing I think is great that I, um, realized was a big help, which is kind of what you're talking about there is creating, designing things in a way such that when something requires your input, your input is requested yes. rather than you always having this background process of like, I need to check in and yes. check in, yes. I need yes. to check in, I need to check in mm -hmm. that like will destroy you, yes. <laughs> you know, that's yeah. the most exhausting thing in the world is feeling mm -hmm. that way. So, um, you know, we've cr tried to create systems, a few systems here that have, have helped with that. I think, um, one of the things was like a few months ago, I wrote up a post for the company that just said like, and this was like an expectation I already had that wasn't communicated and no one knows mm -hmm. what to do mm -hmm. because, you know, it's a perfect example. Of one of these things was, uh, we kind of have a company wide sort of call it policy. I hate that word because you know, it sounds yep. like it's got all this baggage associated with it. But what I kind of wrote up was like, from now on, I want everyone at the company to merge their own pull requests. Mm -hmm. That's like the rule Yeah. because what was happening is someone would open a pull request and they would feel like, okay, someone else has to review this and merge it yeah. uh, before it gets pulled in. But as far as I'm concerned, it's off my plate now yes. because yes. I did my part. I put it into GitHub. Mm -hmm. It's open. I've moved on. I'm not thinking about it. Someone else is going to get it merged in. Yeah. And then that becomes like someone else's problem that they don't mm -hmm. necessarily even realize they have a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. Like, Oh, there's an open pull request here. Like what's going on with this? Should, is this my responsibility? Is this someone else's responsibility? Yeah. So by just making it very clear that if you open a pull request, it will be open until you click the merge button. Yeah. Then it's very just, it's clear who owns getting that code kind that. Of included in, into the library or whatever. Yeah. And that doesn't mean that you don't get review on it, but mm -hmm. it means if, if you, if you feel 
not comfortable hitting that merge button, it's on you to get comfortable. Yes. You know, take whatever steps it asking takes. Asking for input yeah. or, or whatever. And that's changed so much because now I feel like before someone would fix a bug in Tailwind and a pull request would get opened and it would just sit there yeah. expecting me to review it and, and merge it. Yes. And that's like not anyone doing anything wrong. That's right. a totally reasonable assumption, mm-hmm. you know, but there was just people thinking that that made the most sense based yeah. on their context and me feeling like, ah, oh, this is just like drowning me in work that I yes. don't even know that I have, that I feel like I have to be constantly polling these sources to make mm-hmm. sure that there's no stuff waiting for me. Um, but now I just don't have to think about that. I know that if there's something that requires my input before it can be merged, someone will bug me about it because they feel they like need to do that thing. Yeah. Work isn't done until it's merged. That's you great. Know? Um, so th- things like that have been, have been really helpful. And I'd like to figure out ways to sort of codify more of those mm-hmm. things, because I think that's like one of the biggest sources of frustration running a company is just everyone has a different idea of what the right thing to do is no one is doing things knowingly yeah thinking this is a bad way to handle this yeah everyone thinks they're (laughs) handling it at the best way yeah and if you don't address those things it can breed resentment you know Mm -hmm. and um and that is a problem i never expected to have to deal with honestly as, as like someone running a company but it's a it's a real one and i'm trying to get better about that by yeah just just recognizing that you can explain that you want something done differently without it being like an attack on yes. someone and yeah. basically being able to say, listen, I know that you did this this way for reasons X, Y, Z, which totally makes sense yes. given your perspective. Your context and, yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you know, yeah. so you're not in trouble. You didn't do anything wrong, Yep. but I think we should do it this way. And, um, and it, and that is like less, it, it, it it's harder to get comfortable with that than it sounds, mm. at least for me, because yeah. I just don't have any leadership DNA at all. You know, like mm. I just like want to make things by myself. <laughs> um, well, it's so, interesting because you, you do have yeah. leadership DNA because I've had enough conversations with you over the years to understand that you are extraordinarily thoughtful about what it looks like for you to share and teach and stuff like that. But I do think that you're, and I'm just speaking for you, but I feel like your posture towards it is you're, you don't naturally want to tell other people what to do. You want to give them freedom. And so you do, you are a leader, but I don't think that you're a manager by default. Mm -hmm. And I do think that like learning to be a good and caring manager who respects people is really tough, especially because the last thing, like, I remember when you were trying to like figure out how to how to like promote tailwind and stuff like that. The number one thing that like kept you from doing it is you're like, I don't want to be a schmoozy gross salesperson. Who's always just kind of like pitching this stuff all the time. I just want to put it out there and let people like it. And I feel like you probably have that same posture towards managing. You're like, I don't want to tell people what to do all the time and be up in their space. I just want to trust them and respect them. hundred percent. And so it's weird to like find so afraid of telling of giving people too much input or checking in with people. And, um, yeah, Yeah. I don't know. (laughs) It's tough. Yeah, but I, I think and that. If, go ahead, go ahead. I was just gonna say, I think, I think what I'm learning is that I, I'm like that to an extreme detriment, mm-hmm. where people would prefer more, more. Mm-hmm. input than they get a lot yeah. of the time, and um, learning to like be comfortable with that without feeling like I'm stepping on someone's toes has been like a big yeah. challenge. Uh, one of the things that has been really validating for me is the, um, I think you probably heard of the book radical candor and I'm only mm-hmm. just now reading the book, but I'd read, I'd seen like a Ted talk, an article about it that was like, Oh, that's what we're trying to do. I read the intro to the second edition of the book. And she said, I wish I had not called it radical candor. Cause a lot of people use that, um, phrase to like basically justify being assholes all the time. Um, like <laughs> yeah. I'm just going to tell you whatever I feel. And she's like my original title for the book that I didn't use because I was worried it would be seen as too feminine is compassionate candor. And I mm-hmm. think that you're an extraordinarily compassionate person. And I think it's the candor, the, the, the lack of examples of compassionate candor that is, is making it hard because you're used to like people doing this, beating people over the head with it. And I think that candor means like, I don't have the right de- dictionary definition, but like just telling the truth about the things. And like when there's a thing, yeah. just say the thing truthfully. And I think that for me, my goal in this type of a situation is to be like, I'm going to tell you whatever's going on and I'm going to do it lovingly. I'm going to do it respectfully. I'm not going to do it if it's not necessary, but I'm also not going to hold back on what I'm thinking. And so like people at Titan who've come from other companies 
always feel like they have to be dancing around figuring out what I'm not saying. And like one of the first mm -hmm. lessons they have to learn is like, if I don't like what you did, you're going to hear about it immediately. And like, yeah. th that sounds a little scary when your boss says that, but I'm like, you're never going to have to worry if I don't like what you're doing because you will know and you'll trust. And, and the first couple of yeah. times it happens, it gives people this confidence that like, if Matt doesn't like it, he's going to have said it. And you, I could be six minutes in, in of anxiety and something and then check in with Matt. And he's like, look, I would have told you six months ago if that was a problem. And I think that if you set that expectation up with them, it's hard, right? It's a new skill, but they're going to feel so respected and cared for, not like you're smushing on them or anything. So, mm hmm yeah, I agree. That's something I've been looking into more, and I agree is extremely challenging yeah, so <laughs> for tough, me. Anyways, man. it's like so yeah. unnatural. Yeah. Um, but I agree, it's like cruel to do it any mm -hmm. other way. Um, it's selfish, right? Because like we're protecting yeah. ourselves from conflict. Exactly. Yeah, but it's not yeah. what they need. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Dan and I both are conflict avoidant people naturally, and learning that having conflict e conversations that are uncomfortable for us it yeah. was like the most valuable skill we were able to learn to be better for our employees because it was it was it was, it was cruel to not share something with them that we knew and we were thinking about but yeah we didn't want to because we didn't want to feel uncomfortable yeah i think something i always fear with that is if i i mean that's something i'm trying to get better at right now like i literally had a conversation this morning that was yeah. you know that and um it was hard for me yeah. Even though it was totally fine. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I always worry that like once I'm, once I'm doing that all the time, I'm not, I need to balance it out because mm -hmm. I don't want people mm -hmm. to feel like the only time they hear from me is like when something yeah. didn't go the way that I want it to, and then they're going to hate working here and then they're yeah. going to quit and then I'm going to be sad. Yeah. Um, so that's something I would like to figure out how to, how to balance because I, I kind of feel like giving people positive feedback is not natural for me mm -hmm, either, mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. know? And I don't know if that's common for, for other people or what the kind of reason for that is. But I feel like what, I feel like a lot of time it's, um, it's never not genuine, but it's not natural. Mm -hmm. You know, I feel like I'm like, I'm saying something that is out of character for me. Like yeah. if you knew me really, really well, you'd be like, this isn't this is Adam not, yeah, saying okay. that. Like, even though like, of course he thinks the work that you did was really good. It's He's not naturally going to just, gonna just I feel say like, like I'm this. not being me. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, I don't know how to, how to fix that because that's I want to be better yeah. at, at that. You know what I mean? Well, but, okay. um, yeah, I don't know. It's, uh, that is a big challenge. Like all, all of that mm -hmm. feedback in general, I think is like one of the, th the things I struggle the most with as a, as a manager. Yeah. I, my love language is words of affirmation. So giving positive praise is very easy and natural for me. So I can't I identify with that, but I can tell you one thing that, um, after you left that Marge did, she created a channel called kudos where people who are mm -hmm. probably more natural, you know, appreciators go in to share and just say, Hey, this person did this thing was really great. But I've found that being in an environment where that kind of appreciation is named and shared and done on a regular basis actually makes other people more likely to do it. So you yeah. may find that like creating structures and spaces for people to share that where you're not always necessarily the one doing it will first of all help the company environment, but also maybe make it easier for you. But you could also mm -hmm. just say like set a Friday reminder that says every single Friday, like, like my, my kids schools do this, like shout out somebody on something that they did really well that week. And it just becomes a Friday yeah. thing. So it's less like, Oh, Amazon, you know, sorry, I just read Amazon on my email. Oh, Adam's doing something really weird right now. And more like, no, Adam has set up a thing where he's intentionally defining a culture of appreciation at this company. And every Friday, he's going to tell about something somebody did well. So it is notably structured. Like, it's not going to yeah. be like, oh, he's doing this really freaking awkward thing. Interesting. But it's structured in a way that is, but nobody would ever doubt that you believe the things that you're saying, you know? Yeah. And then you don't have to mm -hmm. remember it. It's not a pressure that you have to remember to do sometimes. Mm -hmm. Every Friday, a reminder goes off and says, go give somebody kudos. Yeah. No, oh, that's a great idea. Yeah. You know what? It's a, This is like tangential, but it makes me think of like... um like, I think in general, in life, I've always had a hard time, like, complimenting mm -hmm, people. Mm -hmm. That has just, like, been unnatural for me. And I don't know why that is. Just, you know, my experience growing up or whatever. Yeah. It just always felt like, it always felt like, honestly, more natural to me to, like, put someone down than yeah. to say something nice. Because, like, you're a kid in school and it's like, oh, you can get everyone to laugh and think that they like you because yeah. like you said, like, you made some mean joke or something stupid like that, you know, yeah. and I still carry that with me as an adult. But I think like one of the things that is, um, stressful for me as someone running a company is it feels like if I openly say something like 
I, I feel like I'm not, uh, good at giving positive feedback. And that's something I struggle with. My, my fear is that someone's going to say like, well, if you don't have that skill, you have no business running a fucking company. Like, who do you think yeah. you are? Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Leaders are supposed to be compassionate, whatever. And it's like, yeah. I didn't want to fucking run a company. Yeah. I just wanted to make <laughs> a CSS for- framework. <laughs> I was forced into it, you know? Yeah. And I just want to tell you directly, like, I don't think you have to be a t- particular type of person to run a company. I think everybody should have space to run companies because we can build systems and structures that help us. And we can also bring in other people. Like, I wasn't the one who made the Kudos channel. Like, I do have an easy yeah. time giving compliments to people. But I also think that Marge brings about aspects of our culture like we've slow, like when March joined, her job was like operations coordinator and content manager. And right now we're reworking her role to be more around people because that's what she's really, really, really good at. Right. Yeah. So like, it's not that I am really good at running on sites like Marge and Anna run great on sites and that's okay, but I hire them and I give them money and approval to do so. So I think that anybody who would say like, if you don't have every particular skill that you need to run the company, no, that's why you hire people to do the things. Yeah. It's not just to do the things that you already did well and step away. It's also to do things you don't do well. I am ADHD is hell. Like I, I managed our projects at Titan. Okay. But now we've got Dave and Jean and they're like, type a got everything under control super structured people yeah. and it's way better than it was when i was doing it right so like yeah like like, like dave probably has like an omni focus tattoo i'm sure he does <laughs> yes and there's probably one in the other arm and you know yeah, yeah like absolutely right and so like that that doesn't make me a bad manager because I'm not good at being as structured as they are. If I was the one doing that job, then it would make me a bad manager. But recognizing that I'm not naturally good at it and then helping other people, making space for me to be better and then helping other people have space to do it, that's part of leading well. So anyway, anyone who told you that or that voice in your head, screw them. Uh, you're doing a great <laughs> job, man. And and I, I have Thanks. had enough conversations with you as you have been struggling through how to handle the things that aren't easy, easy and natural for you to be able to say that very truthfully. You're doing a fantastic job and anybody would be lucky to work for you, which is why when you guys put up job postings, you're completely bombed with everybody wants to work there because they know it's going to be a great place to work. So thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. And I mean it. Um, I want to talk for hours more, but we're so far past time. So I'm going to ask you the last question and anybody who's curious about this kind of stuff, um, please follow Adam on Twitter, even though he doesn't talk about this stuff as much. And we'll, I'll give him a chance to plug your Twitter. There's still just so much of your personality and your presence available in your online presences. And I think it's something that's good for everybody to have. So last question, what insight or support did you either receive or not receive, but need when you were younger that you hope more people will give to others? Hmm. I don't know if this fully fits in that category, but when I think about like my experience growing up and how it was maybe different than other people's and how it helped me get where I am, I was really fortunate to be in like a gifted education program my entire time that I was in school. And the thing that I remember most from that is we, for like, four years, I think it was like grade five, six, seven, and eight. When I was really in the totally full-time program, every single Friday was this thing called negotiated learning day Okay, where you would define a project that you made up. Um, and we, we do two projects a year. I think we'd make up some project, whatever the hell we wanted. It could be literally anything. Yeah. Uh, you pitched it to the teacher and they always said yes, or helped <laughs> you kind of scope it down or refine mm-hmm. it or make it better or whatever. And every single Friday we got to work on those projects in a Mm. different room in the school with no adults in the room the entire day, um, doing, working on it ourselves, um, kind of defining our own progress and Mm -hmm. doing it wherever we wanted. And I think like if, if I didn't have those experiences growing up where I was like given the freedom to create, Mm -hmm. I don't think there's any chance that I would have landed where I am now. And even in high school, when we were still in that program, we were given two weeks to stay at home and work on something ourselves. Wow. We didn't even have to come to school, miss yeah. every class for every other course, whatever. <laughs> wow. I just really believe that like, there's so much power in giving people permission to, f- mm. to focus on the things that they're really naturally interested in mm-hmm. and not force them to spend time on things that they don't care about. That's so cool. Um, and that's something I think about a lot now that yeah. I have kids and how to make sure, cause I can't can guarantee that my kids are going to be in a program like right. that, you know? <laughs> um, so I, I don't know how to, how to solve that problem, but it's something that I think about a lot is how do you, how do you double down 
on people's interests instead mm-hmm. of forcing them to focus on, on their weaknesses. I, love I that. think it's natural to tell people, okay, well, you got a C in this class. Well, that means you That's have to spend to work all on. your time yes. studying geography because you got a C in it. Yeah. But if you got like an A plus in <laughs> programming, then go spend or less time in it. A plus right? in music or something, <laughs> you don't need to spend as much mm-hmm. time on that, right? It's like if this kid got an A plus in programming, then we should be like signing him up for a, a programming club that he can yes. go to on the weekends, yes. not yeah. signing him up for more geography, geography <laughs> tutoring, you know? Yeah. That's my opinion anyways. So that mm. I feel like I got a lot of that support mm. when I was, I was a kid uh, and got to spend a, a lot of time doing the things that I was really excited about. And that created this kind of natural maker mm-hmm. attitude, yeah. you know, that I think I meet so many people now who who don't have that. And I have to believe that, you know, that those differences and what, how we were encouraged in school mm-hmm. and stuff must, must've contributed to that. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, I don't know if that totally fits. It totally what, does. Uh, it's it's amazing. Asking, but yeah. that's and, what I think about a lot. And yeah. for any parents who are interested in that kind of stuff, I know that that's kind of the foundations of Montessori. And the problem is at least in the U S you can't get a Montessori without paying for private schools. Is, is that even something mm-hmm. that you've you heard of it before? Yeah, my daughter's in Montessori. Oh well, there you go. Here, so you're already doing they, it. <laughs> they literally only do it until kindergarten, yeah, okay. and then after that, I don't know what she's going to do. Okay, but yeah, so, it's the same thing, right? One like thing, self-directed one thing I've learning. talked about, okay. like this is like my dream. My like, I don't know if I uh, would actually find this that fun. But if if I was ever going to be like totally done with kind of running Tailwind as a company and yeah. doing all that stuff, like I dream about the next phase of my life being like creating a private education stream for people who want to be involved in things like this. Like sometimes mm-hmm. I dream about, should we rent like a tailwind labs HQ in downtown Kitchener or something? Cause me mm-hmm. and Steve only live 25 minutes away from each other. Yeah. Rent like a building that has like, um, a top floor where me and Steve can work and like a bottom floor where me and Steve can both drive our kids to work with us in the morning and we hire two teachers and they are down there that and they be believe cool. in the same thing yeah. that we want and find other parents who want to do it. And, uh, that's amazing. I don't know. Like that, that actually gets me pretty excited. The huh. idea of trying to give that opportunity to more people. Like it's a miracle that I even had what I had. Cause like the, the government paid for a taxi to pick me up at my house and drive me to school every day because like, wow, my parents didn't have money. You know, uh-huh. like we're immigrants mm-hmm. from the UK who moved over here. My dad to work as like a CNC operator or machinist uh-huh. and my mom didn't work yeah. and then she worked retail and, and, um, you know, like the fact that I even got to take part in that at all is like crazy. So, um, I don't know. It'd be, I, I don't, I have a lot of skepticism around the public education system yes. uh, that most people go through. And, uh, I could see myself getting more excited about, spending time in that in the future. That's really interesting. I'm really looking forward to hearing more about that. If that's something you do, you know, I got young kids and they're in the public education system. But one of the things I did was like, when we moved to Atlanta, I spent months researching what schools I want to put them in. And then I, I picked Mm -hmm. everything around the schools because I'm like, there's so many other things we can work around. We can live in a smaller house. We can, you know, whatever. But like, if I can't get them this educational experience, and of course, lots of parents are that way, but like, you really want to set them up well. And we can recognize like you just did, like how much those experiences, like my kids are at school more than they're with me every day. Right. So like, yeah. that's, a, that's a pretty freaking important thing, but I'd never even had the mm-hmm. imagination that you're having here. It's really cool. <laughs> so I know we're cool. super late and I'm sure you have work to get to, but, um, this was freaking fantastic. So if people want to follow you, if they want to support you, if they are interested in tailwind or if they're just interested in the way your brain works, what would be the best way to follow you? Yeah, uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Adam Wathen. Check out Tailwind CSS at tailwindcss.com. We just did a big, major version release last week Love with it. a big new website and stuff like that. And um, yeah, that's kind of it. Yeah, Full Stack that's Radio. I, these days. I know that you're not making new stuff right now, but if anybody's uh, interested, FullStackRadio.com has like what, 150 episodes or something like that. Lots yeah, a bunch of, really of good stuff. In there. Lots of content. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to keep doing that occasionally. Good. I think. Okay. Uh, yeah. I think there'll be like a couple episodes a year yeah. sort of thing. Just when, like it, when it comes up, just do it. Yeah. Come up. Well, definitely if yeah, you're into, especially so. as a programmer, but even if you're not a programmer, there's someone there that, you know, just skim through the episodes and look through the, which titles will make sense, but it's a lot of really great stuff. And I will be very direct and honest that full stack radio was very much an inspiration for making this show. Cause I was like, I want to sit with fascinating people who I, I just want the excuse to talk to people who I, you know, admire. So 
thank you for all your cool. inspiration. <laughs> and thanks for hanging out today, dude. This was a ton of fun. And I do think that I and everybody else is going to learn a ton from it. Awesome. All right. Thanks, man. For the rest of you, uh, until next time, be good to each other. Bye.